In this lecture, we will talk about vitamin D. We will diagram and explain the vitamin D pathway. Describe the role of vitamin D in calcium regulation and bone health. And review the current research on the role of vitamin D in systemic health. There's a lot of debate about the current research of vitamin D for other functions besides calcium regulation and bone health. We're going to begin to introduce you to some of those resources so you can take a look at that current research and follow it as it changes in the next few years. So vitamin D is also called calcitriol. Its chemical name is 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D3. It's an important molecule for calcium and phosphate homeostasis. As I said, it has many other proposed functions which are currently debated. It's produced by the skin, but it can also be obtained in the diet. The primary function of vitamin D, as we understand it now, is for calcium and phosphate homeostasis. Increased levels of vitamin D increase calcium and phosphate in the blood through absorption in the small intestine. It also works together with parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone can activate vitamin D increase renal reabsorption of calcium, and increase renal excretion of phosphate. We talked about parathyroid hormone and vitamin D back in the calcium lecture. Today we're going to focus on vitamin D functions. Vitamin D helps to enhance bone calcification because it increases the availability of calcium and phosphate to allow that calcium and phosphate mineralization of bone to occur. This is important both in bone growth in children, but also in bone remodeling and maintaining the structure of bone in adults. Other proposed functions of vitamin D can be literally everything. So if you start looking at the research for vitamin D, you're going to see so many different links. You'll see links to cancer and diabetes and heart disease and multiple sclerosis and hypertension and so many things. Currently, what we see is that vitamin D may also have a role in cell growth, immune function, neurologic function, and reduction of inflammation. We anticipate this will change a lot over the next few years as that research continues. Looking at vitamin D can be a little bit confusing because there's multiple forms of vitamin D. As it goes from inactive precursor, gets processed, and then becomes the active form of vitamin D. The first inactive precursor is ergocalciferol. This is also referred to as vitamin D2. This is found within the skin and is an inactive precursor when exposed to UV light that is converted to cholecalciferol or vitamin D3 by the skin. Cholecalciferol then travels through the bloodstream and is hydroxylated to calcifidiol or 25-hydroxy vitamin D3. Hydroxylated means that you add that OH group to the molecule. It's an intermediate form with a long half-life. It's commonly used in lab tests because it's found in the blood much more stably than the active form of vitamin D. We need one more hydroxylation step to form calcitriol or 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D3, and that is an active form of vitamin D. Vitamin D2 and D3, by the way, are commonly found in the supplements which you would buy at the drugstore. So these multiple forms of vitamin D are activated through the vitamin D activation pathway. Vitamin D activation requires processing by the liver and the kidneys. As we said, vitamin D2 is found in the skin. When the skin is exposed to UV light, the skin produces vitamin D3 or cholecalciferol. That then travels through the bloodstream to the liver, where it's hydroxylated into calcifidiol, or 25-hydroxy vitamin D3. This is the very stable form 
which we will use primarily in blood tests for vitamin D. Vitamin D3, or calcifidiol, in this form will then travel to the kidneys where we have the final hydroxylation step to form 1,25-hydroxy vitamin D3. That's the active form of vitamin D that will then go to the intestines to help absorb calcium and phosphate through the intestines. So production of vitamin D requires exposure to sunlight or supplementation through the diet or through supplements of D2 and D3 and functional activation in the liver and functional activation in the kidney. Here's a summary of that. If you need a second, pause here and review this pathway, which requires sunlight, skin, processing in the liver, and processing in the kidneys until we finally get that vitamin D, which is going to activate the digestive tract to absorb calcium and phosphate. It's important to understand this pathway because vitamin D deficiency can be caused by liver disease, kidney disease, inability to absorb vitamin D from the diet by intestinal conditions such as celiac disease and Crohn's disease, or lack of UV light exposure, specifically UVB light. Vitamin D deficiency can lead to rickets in children and osteomalacia in adults. This is softening or weakening of bone due to lack of vitamin D, lack of sunlight, or dietary insufficiency, or lack of calcium or phosphate. This leads to the decreased mineralization of bone. The clinical presentation includes bone tenderness, deformity of bone, joint pain, and an increased fracture risk. In children, this can lead to growth problems a varus deformity, which is a bowing of the legs, and cartilage deformities, specifically costochondral swellings, which are referred to as the rickety rosary, a lumbar lordosis, or a sway back appearance, and green stick fractures, which are particular fractures we see in children with, under, with bones that have not yet fully developed. There can also be muscular neurologic, cardiovascular, and other consequences of rickets and osteomalacia. In the United States, from 2004 to 2018, the National Institute of Health, through the Office of Dietary Supplements, led and sponsored several efforts to advance the scientific understanding of the importance of vitamin D. Like many other dietary supplements, the research here was not well understood. Because this research is changing so much, I want to make sure to give you the links to this website so that you're able to stay in the know as this research changes. So here below, I'm giving you a direct link to the current research and to the health professional's fact sheet on vitamin D. I'm gonna share a couple of the key points with you now. First, the dietary sources of vitamin D. So skin, as we said, produces vitamin D when exposed to UVB sunlight. How much? About 10 to 30 minutes of sun exposure is usually adequate for most individuals. Dietary sources include fatty fish and fish oils, beef liver, certain types of cheese, egg yolks, and mushrooms. And in the United States, fortified foods often have vitamin D fortified. Cereals, milk, certain types of orange juice, and certain milk alternatives. Note that it is also required to have vitamin D in all infant formulas, and vitamin D supplementation is necessary for breastfed infants because vitamin D is not found in breast milk. This table shows the serum levels of vitamin D as we currently understand them for bone and overall health. Approximately, approximately a level over 50 
nanomoles per liter, is generally considered adequate for bone and overall health in healthy individuals. There's emerging evidence that link potential adverse effect to extremely high levels of vitamin D over 125 nanomoles per liter, or over 100, and particularly over 150. Because this is an over-the-counter supplement, it's important to talk to your patients about any supplements that are taking, and don't just assume that more is better. So what's the recommended amount of vitamin D? In children, it varies from about 400 to 600 international units. In adults, it's about 600 international units. And in elderly patients over the age of 70, 800 or higher is recommended for adequate intake and adequate serum levels of vitamin D. So keep an eye on this research, keep an eye on how it's changing so that we can serve all of our patients and their calcium and bone health. All right, that's it for this lecture. Let me know if you have any questions.